shows why we're here today. Huh? Patient safety, right. What particularly, what specifically about patient safety? Patient identifiers. Patient identifiers. Why is that? Why are we talking about patient identifiers today? Because we made some mistakes. Because we have some problems with identifying patients, right? Exactly, exactly. So, um, so for example, um, we have um, sent uh, the wrong patient to another facility. Did you hear about that one? No. Yeah, we sent the wrong patient. Went through three of our staff, two ambulance attendants. And when the patient got to the other facility, they did an ID check found out it was the wrong patient. We've also given um, a patient to somebody else's <coughs> discharge meds, and that's kind of problematic because we can't find that patient now. That patient is a homeless person, and they have somebody else's site meds. So, um, and we've had other we've had other events as well, which I'll go over with you uh, shortly. But um, for those of you who haven't heard the patient safety talk at, at, at um, new employee orientation, anybody heard this here talk before? No one in this group. I, yeah, okay, I didn't think so. Um, just want to talk a little bit about um, our philosophy here of patient safety at Arrowhead. Um, and uh, we want to just talk a little bit about um, uh, how we like to think about patient safety. And we use um, Dr. Um, Reason, James Reason's, um, uh, what, what they call the Swiss cheese philosophy, or Swiss cheese metaphor of how um, adverse events happen to patients. So um, Dr. Reason came up with this idea and this metaphor uh, by looking at complex systems like aircraft carriers, hospitals, nuclear power plants, and realized that um, bad things are prevented from happening by a series of barriers, okay? Um, so um, adverse events here at the hospital are, are prevented by some barriers that we have. And then each barrier can have unintended holes or weaknesses in it. Um, uh, hence the similarity to Swiss cheese. So this is kind of a model of, um, of what that might look like. So the blue discs are the barriers and the, and the uh, holes are the weaknesses in the barriers. Um, so when we talk about um, barriers to patient harm, what am I talking about? Anybody give me, an, give me an example of a barrier? Anyone? Patient identifier. But what you're really telling me is our policy about how we identify patients, right, before we do something to them. <coughs> Similarly, um, hand hygiene is another policy. Um, our med pass policy is another barrier, okay? And what, what we mean by the holes come and go sometimes is that you have a policy that says you're supposed to wash your hands on entering a <coughs> patient's room. Sometimes you get distracted and you forget you know, to wash them away. The whole doesn't happen all the time, it happens sometimes. So similarly, like in in um, MedPass, you know, you know you're supposed to scan the patient's fans, scan the med, give the med. I know that you guys you guys have scanning over there yet? You have, you have UPH? Not really, right? Yes, we you do. do. You've got it. Okay, um, but you're supposed to do all of those things. So there's a process, and sometimes if you're distracted or what have you, you might forget to scan. So there's a hole in that barrier. Okay. So if you pass through these barriers successively, there's a chance you can hit the patient, and that's why we like to use this metaphor because when we look at when we look at how bad things happen to patients, <laughs> usually it's not just one thing; it's a series of a series of mistakes, a series of events or a series of holds. But we also like to use this metaphor because um, it draws attention to the healthcare system as opposed to you, the individual, and um, as re to randomness of action as opposed to deliberate action. So what do I mean by that? So um, if you um, give Sally Smith uh, uh, aspirin instead of a Tylenol by mistake, okay, I can be reasonably sure that you weren't standing in line at Starbucks this morning and decide that you were going to give Sally Smith an aspirin instead of a Tylenol, okay? What that means is there's something in the environment, in our process, in our um, workflow, for example, uh, that 
uh, allowed that error to happen. Okay, not necessarily, you didn't do it deliberately. That's not to say that, um, uh, you know, that's not to say that we don't have personal responsibility at some level, but we look at errors that happen and we look at them in terms of systems problems, not you the individual. We don't want to place blame. Uh, we want to really fix the system. We want to figure out why did this happen? If it wasn't a personal responsibility issue, then uh, we want to fix that. We want to look at the process and, and see if we can fix it, okay? <coughs> so uh, we're really here today to talk about, um, uh, there we go. Uh, we're really here today to talk about uh, patient identification. Uh, and we'll talk about that here if I can get this to work. In a second. Um, so when we talk about uh, patient identification, uh, I can tell you that I want you to I want you to identify a patient using name and date of birth, um, and you will take that information and you will decide what that means. Okay. Um, so I find that uh, it's best to actually demonstrate. So when I um, uh, was on the East Coast a couple of years ago, my mom was sick. She was at a place called the Lady Clinic in Burlington, Massachusetts. Um, uh, what I noticed there was that everybody who came to see us in the holding area did the exact same thing. It didn't matter whether it was the nurse, the, the attending, the resident, the phlebotomist, the EKG technician, they all did the same thing. They came in and they said, hi, I'm Dr. So-and-so or I'm so-and-so, and can you tell me your name and date of birth while they look at the band and check it against the band, okay? And that was absolutely hardwired. When we went to the room, into her room afterwards, after the surgery, anybody who came into the room did that. They did it every single time. Didn't matter, didn't matter whether they had been in there a half an hour or an hour before, if they were gonna do something to her, give her something, all right, do a procedure, they did it again, okay? And um, they set it up because, you know, people say, well, you know, if I, if, I, if I do that every half an hour to the patient I'm taking care of, they're gonna think I got a memory problem. Uh, you know, I can't remember who they are. Uh, but really, they set it up by telling us that, look, we're really, we're really all about patient safety here, and, um, you know, anytime anyone comes to do anything to you or give you anything, they're gonna actually check to see who you are, and they're gonna check that band. Okay? It was absolutely hardwired. It was like please and thank you. And that's where we have to get here. So the reason that I show you what I, how we want you to do it is because if I didn't do that, everyone has a certain idea of how that might be, how, 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 how you might do it. So one of the commonest um, ways that people ask if they haven't been shown is they ask by leading. Does anybody know what that means? You come in, you come up to somebody and say, um, Mrs. Jones, okay, all right, or you go to a room like this in the waiting room and you say, Mary Smith, okay, now the problem with doing that is that if you go to a room full of people like this is that about three out of ten times when you say <coughs> Mary Smith, somebody else is going to stand up, okay, why is that? Lots of reasons, right, hearing impaired, English may not be first language, um, you know, uh, could be our medications that affect, uh, that affect them, could be distracted. I mean, you know, everybody plays on a cell phone these days, okay? So uh, there's lots of reasons. That's why we don't want you to ask why leading. So about a year ago, uh, we had a, a third year ophthalmology resident, just about ready to graduate, go out into the holding area and call uh, a patient's name, you know, Mary Smith, and um, uh, went over, the patient said, uh, you know, <coughs> went over, the resident went over and said, hi, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and I'm just going to put these drops in your eye. Put the first drop in, put the second drop in. And over here, behind him, said, hi, I'm, I'm Mrs. Smith. I think you're looking for me. Okay, this one that was getting the eye drops was waiting for a colonoscopy. Okay, now, you know, the eye drops dilate the eye, and if this lady who had, was going to have a colonoscopy had narrowing of glaucoma, we'd be in really, really a lot of trouble because you can lose your eyesight when you dilate the eyes. Okay? So, and you might ask yourself, why didn't this patient speak up? But you know, you know that our patients do, don't have a lot, don't have healthcare experience. They're not healthcare providers, most of them. 
And so they wouldn't know whether you need an eye drop before you get a colonoscopy. For all they know, you do. So that's kind of the reason why we don't want to ask by leading. Okay? The other thing is, is we don't want to ask, uh, we don't want to talk about patients as if they're room members. Okay? So um, not long before I started doing patient safety here, we had two patients in the emergency room. One of them had an abdominal process and was having abdominal pain of some kind and was being worked up for that, was getting some pain meds. The other patient came in and had a fractured femur, it was in a motor vehicle accident. So um, the orthopedic PA saw the patient with the fractured femur and called the orthopedic resident and said, I got a guy down here that uh, needs a Steinman pin. Anybody know what a Steinman pin is? So when you break your leg, sometimes when you break this bone, this long bone, they have to drill a hole just down below it, and they put a steel pin in, and then they connect that pin to a rope that hangs over the bottom of the bed, and put weights on it, and it puts traction on the bone and straightens it out. You've all probably seen maybe get well cars that have someone laying in the bed with the weights, same thing. So the orthopedic resident came down about an hour later, said to the clerk, where's the guy that needs a Steinman pin? The clerk said, I think it's room three. The resident went into room three, called the other resident into the room, said, get the Steinman kit. They drilled a hole in the guy's leg, put the pin in. Problem? Wrong guy. No broken leg. That happened here. So the reason I tell you these things is that so you can be aware of them when you're doing, going about your daily work. And that you can understand that if you don't follow the policies and the procedures, it can happen to you. Yeah. Because it happens to well-meaning people, but it, you know, it's, and it, ju it just does. So you, you, we we really want you to follow uh, the rules. Um, so that's really um, really what I wanted to say today. I'm not going to belabor the issue. Um, you know, we've had cases over here at the hospital. Uh, on the hospital side, um, we had a patient that had a fractured ankle, and the ortho tech was called to put a pneumo boot on. Anybody know what a pneumo boot is? That's one of those little booties that you put on when someone has a fracture like that. It's, it's an air, air, air boot. So basically you put it on and blow it up and it's like a cast. So you can imagine what, what must have not happened when the ortho tech went into the wrong room and started to put the boot on the patient. And the patient said, I think it's my other foot because she didn't know what was going on but she knew she had swelling in the other foot. Not a broken bone, but swelling. Didn't have a broken ankle at all. And there was some back and forth, but anyway, it was, the boot was left on the original foot, and off the ortho tech went. Problem, wrong patient, okay? And so um, you can imagine what conversation didn't happen, right? You walk into somebody's room, wouldn't you say, hi, I'm so-and-so from orthopedics. I hear you have a fractured ankle, can you show me? and I'm going to put this cast on. None of that must have happened. You can, none of it. So, uh, again, we, we bring this up because we do have these procedures in place. They do protect our patients. Um, I gave you some examples, real life examples that happen here. Uh, you know, so, uh, and we, so we really want you to pay attention. Um, so now, if no one's said to me yet, uh, well, some of our patients and behavioral health don't want to keep ID bands on, right? Mm -hmm. But I understand that. But you know what? The patient that we sent to some other facility, the wrong patient, the patient that we gave somebody else's meds to, they all had ID bands on. So my point is, whatever you're doing to the patients that don't have IDs, you must be doing all right. But it's the ones that have the IDs that we're not checking. All right? Um, so so that's, that's uh, pretty much what I have to say today. Anybody have any questions? What about if the patient's nonverbal? What do you do? You're going to start a patient on a new psych med. The patient's nonverbal for whatever reason. What do you do? Anybody know? <coughs> you can get this. Get the patient's chart and verify it with one of your colleagues at the bedside using the band. Okay? All right. Well, thank you for your attention. I know it's I know it's changed a shift, so I'll let you go. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you.